One of the more difficult challenges when running Kubernetes at scale is cost allocation. There's so many components typically involved in or under the umbrella of your EKS cluster, especially in multi-tenant environments. It's certainly not that helpful to simply get a total cost as the output of everything going into this Kubernetes operational funnel. One of the steps to cost optimization is to have enough transparency around the expenditure tied to each of these different components. Let's take the example of an organization running multiple microservices. Each microservice could represent a product and is probably going to be owned by a single product team. Or a product team may have a subset of microservices that it owns in the bigger architecture. A company might have 20, 50, 80 or more of these products. In cases like this, it's especially important to have the visibility to trace the costs related to specific components like nodes, ingress gateways, namespaces, allocated storage, a specific workload, and the replicas tied to those workloads. The more granular, the better. This kind of information can serve as a precursor for decisions related to cost optimization. Otherwise, cost optimization becomes a lot harder when all you have to work with is a single figure for the total cost. It's also not prudent to try and cut costs from a high level, like a total cost, because you don't know what impact a reduction in cluster resources will have on your workloads, and by implication, end users or other clients dependent on the high availability of your workloads. More information is required. For all you know, product team A is responsible for 45% of your Kubernetes-related costs from a list of 20 other products. Having a total cost for a specific product team, as well as a granular cost breakdown, will allow you to investigate why they're using the nodes they're using and why a certain application requests the amount of CPU or memory that it does. Another important reason for cost allocation is to reduce the cost-related burden of certain product teams or departments by setting teams up to only pay for what they're using in a shared cluster environment. In this video, I'll demonstrate one approach to achieving something like this and it involves using taints and tolerations, Carpenter, Cost Explorer, and KubeCost. There are other tools that you can use to achieve a similar outcome, but perhaps this will serve some teams looking for a model or example that will help them accomplish this. Before I switch to my editor, I'll start by briefly explaining what purpose each of these components is going to serve. I'll start with taints and tolerations. With taints, you can influence where the scheduler places pods in your cluster. You can essentially tell your nodes to reject or repel certain pod placements, as well as influence how strictly the scheduler should take the effects of these taints. And it's a great way to dedicate certain nodes or compute capacity to teams or products. If you think about a multi-tenancy model where multiple teams are sharing a cluster, it's definitely one approach to set resource constraints, but it's also very useful to dedicate certain nodes to teams or products. Also, if there are pods that require specialized hardware, whether it's high compute or memory capacity, then adding taints can be useful to keep other workloads away from using up those dedicated nodes. Next is Carpenter. I'm going to use Carpenter's provisioners to add compute capacity to my cluster for specific workloads. So in the provisioner config, I'll add taints so that only certain applications can run on the nodes provided by a given Carpenter provisioner. I'll also specify team-specific labels that should be added to these nodes. Another benefit Carpenter will give me is compute capacity that is better aligned to the requirements of a specific workload. And with consolidation enabled, that provides a degree of protection from underutilization and paying more than what I need to for a workload in terms of what it actually requires. And then there is Cost Explorer. And this is what will provide me with the first layer of visibility. Carpenter will automatically apply tags to the nodes that it adds to the cluster. And you can also add custom ones if you want to. Now, in order to see the cost breakdown, specifically for nodes dedicated to a certain team or product, I can use the tags applied to the nodes. But I have to activate these user-defined tags before I can use this filtering mechanism in Cost Explorer. And I've placed a link to the docs in the description that will walk you through setting this up. And finally, there's KubeCost. I'm going to use it for more granular breakdowns of the costs involved in my workloads. With KubeCost, I'll be able to see the spend based on a namespace, each application in that namespace, as well as CPU, memory, networking, load balancing costs, all of these components tied to each application in terms of their costing. With both Cost Explorer and KubeCost, you can generate and export the relevant details in a standard format like a CSV or PDF for reporting purposes. 
And the end result is the visibility of what the costs are for the different components for a given product or team. All right, so first things first, I'm calling my example application an e-commerce app, but it's very bare bone. One GraphQL service, an order service, and a product service. The GraphQL service is the API gateway and data aggregator for the other two services. But that's just for context, it's not our focus at all. Each of these will live inside an e-commerce namespace in my EKS cluster. My main aim is to track the costs associated with this project and its three related microservices. If my e-commerce app shares nodes with other applications, that's going to obscure the kind of cost transparency that I'm hoping for. I wanna be able to go to Cost Explorer as well as KubeCost and filter to see costs just for the e-commerce project. Now, firstly, I'm gonna be focusing on the aspect of the node costs. So I want the right kind of visibility that is specific in Cost Explorer. So let's start by taking a look at the Carpenter Provisioner config. And I've named my Provisioner e-commerce because it's exclusively used to control the life cycle of nodes for this e-commerce project. And you can see here that I have consolidation enabled. Right under it, I have my taint properties that will be applied to the e-commerce nodes. And the no schedule effect means pods that don't tolerate the taint won't be scheduled on the node. However, if pods were scheduled to the node before the taint was applied, they won't be evicted and will continue to run as per norm. But this rule or effect applies to any subsequent pod placements. So remember, the purpose of taints is to repel certain pods, but we don't wanna repel every single pod. So how do we place pods on nodes that have taints? And that's where tolerations come in. And you can see over here, I have my manifest for GraphQL orders and products, each of our micro services. In order for a pod to tolerate a taint, it must match, let me scroll down slightly so you can see the toleration over here. And as you can see, it matches the exact same key value pair and the effect of the taint. That is a requirement in order for a pod to tolerate a taint. Another important property when matching tolerations to taints is the operator property. The operator value can either be equal, which is the default value, or it can be exists. And if the operator is set to equal or not defined altogether because it's the default value, then the value from the taint has to be specified in the toleration. On the other hand, if you use the exists operator, then you don't need to specify the taint value. The key in effect will suffice as long as they match the taint. Now I'm gonna switch over to K9S. And as you can see, I've already deployed my applications to my EKS cluster. You can see they're all running inside of the e-commerce namespace. If you pay close attention to the left-hand side, I've got multiple replicas for the GraphQL service, the order service, and the products service. Now I can also take a look at what the cost outlook of these, the nodes that these pods are deployed on, would look like just by going to EKS node viewer. And you can see over here, I'm using, I'm filtering with the node selector label specifically for nodes that are provisioned by Carpenter for the e-commerce project. And as you can see over here, I'm able to see the utilization as well as get an idea of the cost for each of the nodes and the pod placements. And like I said, you can also get an outlook for a cost outlook for the rest of the month. But I want to see the I want to see this in Cost Explorer as well, because remember, Cost Explorer is where I'll be able to actually export a CSV file, which is great for reporting purposes and can later be merged or amalgamated with any other reports, even from KubeCost. So let's switch to that. So as I mentioned before, you will have to activate the user-defined tags that you want to make use of. I've already done this, and so since this box is checked, I'm going to go ahead and filter by the desired tag. You can see the tag key over here, carpenter.sh, and the provisioner name. When I click on the list of values, you'll notice that I have both e-commerce and express node.js, and each of these represents the different sets of nodes that I have. Now, I'm only interested in e-commerce, so that's what I'm gonna select and apply. And you can see over here, the cost and usage graph has updated. Now I can see a cost breakdown for the e-commerce nodes as opposed to just a total cost. 
Also, if I wanted to, I can export these results as a CSV. And this way, even though I have multiple nodes and workloads in a shared cluster, I have visibility and reporting capabilities for the infrastructure costs of specific teams and projects using the tags applied to the Carpenter provision nodes. And because of the taints and their associated effects, I can tie the node cost to the appropriate team, project, or department. But this is just one layer in our Kubernetes cost funnel. Let's take a look at the others in KubeCost. Now I'm in KubeCost, and all we're interested in here is the cost allocation, which you can find under the monitoring section. And remember, our main concern is the e-commerce project. So I'm going to click on that. And now I can see a cost breakdown at a microservice level. And you can see we've got different categories and columns right here at the top, which is very helpful for us to see categorical costs tied to each one of our microservices. And of course, we've got a total right on the end of the far right, rather. And I want to focus on one of the columns or categories. You can see here we have load balancing. And you'll notice that orders and microservices do orders and products rather do not have any costs tied to them in the load balancing category, whereas the GraphQL service does. And the reason for this is because of the role that our GraphQL service is fulfilling. It is actually receiving requests from a public facing load balancer and then aggregating data from the upstream services that it communicates with orders and products. So it is actually fulfilling the role of a load balancer. Hence the cost that is tied to it. But let's drill down even further. And now the cost breakdown is at a replica level. I'm going to scroll down even further. And this is very useful, especially over a period of time, if and when your application undergoes certain changes. For example, an app may start using more CPU cores, which will result in a cost increase and can be seen in this same view. And that would also be the case if we have a stateless application that starts making use of storage. It will then have a persistent volume cost tied to it. There, and these are cost changes that we can see at a granular level for replicas of the same application over a period of time. Now, if all we had was a generic total cost that had gone up, we might be so focused on trimming cluster resources, not knowing that the reason for cost changes is because of certain changes in our applications. And with this granular cost information, we can look at ways of cutting costs in a more prudent way, knowing that we still have to cater to certain changes in our applications, like a need for additional CPU or more storage. And the transparency and visibility provided by cost allocation will inform you to perform better cost optimization. And that brings us to the end of this video on cost allocation. I covered how taints and tolerations with Carpenter can help dedicate nodes to certain projects or workloads, then looked at costs tied to those specific nodes in Cost Explorer, and just wrapped up a brief walkthrough on how cost allocations in KubeCost can provide even more granular details that will eventually inform your cost optimization exercises. As usual, let us know if you found this helpful by providing feedback and stay tuned for more.